Amen. Please go ahead and have a seat. Uh, today we are continuing in our sermon series called Entrusted. If you have your Bible or Bible app, go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 21, verses 1 through 4. Uh, if you don't have a Bible with you, you are welcome to use the Bible underneath the seat in front of you and turn to page 1046. And as always, if you don't have a Bible that you could read or understand easily, we want to invite you to take one of our Bibles home with you and begin to read it. Because we believe that as we read God's Word, the Holy Spirit begins to work in our hearts and we desire to begin to apply it to our lives. And as we apply God's Word to our life, we will experience a changed life. Many of us today are looking for hope. Many of us feel broken. Many of us feel at the end of our rope. And I promise you, if we apply God's word to our lives, regardless of the situation that you're in, you will experience life change. Uh, before I begin today's message, I've missed you. Uh, I don't know if you've noticed, it's been five to six weeks since the last time that I preached. Uh, briefly, I wanted to share with you uh, why that is. Uh, personally, this is just a personal message. Uh, back in October of 2020, my second oldest daughter was diagnosed with T1D. And, and then, so in addition, that my oldest daughter and now my second oldest daughter. And then in April of 2021, my third oldest daughter was diagnosed with T1D. Uh, that means it's an autoimmune disease and it means that they require insulin every single day in order to live. That's not the path that I chose for my daughters. That's not the plan that I had for them. And then uh, this past summer, uh, two of them were diagnosed, one with celiacs and another one with Hashimoto's disease, which sounds much worse than what it is. But I, through it all, I just kind of kept chugging along. My wife is amazing. She's a trooper. She's just like, okay, let's go. Let's move forward. And that's what I was doing as well. But on the inside, I've been drying up over the last year. On, on the inside, I've been doing a lot of hurt because this isn't what I wanted for them. And I was hurting more than what I realized. I was crushed, uh, depressed, and I pulled myself out of the preaching rotation so that I could just uh, focus on listening to the Lord and finding some help for really my, my broken spirit. And I know that when you see me on the weekends and I'm smiling, hey, how are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm a liar. I, I haven't been great. And I know that as we continue to press forward, as we continue to, uh, to wrestle with this uh, one day at a time, sometimes one hour at a time, I've had to recognize uh, an important truth that I want to make sure that you understand as well. I used to travel the nation a little bit telling teenagers about the past that God had rescued me from. I told them about how God rescued me from abuse and how God rescued me from an alcoholic father, how God rescued me from a broken home, how I was in a psychiatric hospital for three months, and yet I've experienced God's faithfulness in my life and God rescued me from that past. Now I've acknowledged that I need Jesus not just to be the savior of my past, but I need Jesus to be the savior in my present. I need Jesus, to, I need to continue to cast my cares onto him. I need to continue to, to cast my family onto him. And I need Jesus to continue to be my savior. He's not just the savior of my past, but he's the savior right now. He's your savior right now. So I want to ask that you would just continue to pray for, uh, continue to pray for our family as you've been doing. We, we covet that and, and continue to uh, understand that Many of us carry burdens and weights that nobody knows about. And one of our core values is transparent living. So deal with me being transparent. Uh, sorry, you got to deal with it, but you have to deal with it. Now, let's go back to our Entrusted series. You, you may have noticed uh, that this Entrusted series is focusing on money. And all we want to do is seek to help you understand what the Bible has to teach us about money, where it comes from and what we do with it. 
If you're a first-time guest, you're probably thinking, oh, great, it's the first time I've walked into the church in months or into any church in months, and now I have a depressed pastor talking about money. <laughs> well, just so you don't feel any sort of pressure, I want you to hear what Pastor Chad said a few weeks ago in his message. He said, God doesn't need your money and the church doesn't need your money. I hope that takes the pressure off of you. When you pass the offering boxes on your way out, I hope you don't clutch your purse or hold your wallet a little you know, tight. I, I want that to take the pressure off. The reason we're offering this entrusted series is because we believe that what we do with the money that God has entrusted to us is a great indicator of our spiritual health. And if you've been a guest for the last few weeks, you've noticed we don't pass the offering plate. Uh, we have boxes located, wooden boxes located on your way out if people want to give. But we don't believe in twisting people's arms to get them to give financially. Back in Jesus' day in the temple, they took up offerings very similar to the way that we take up our offering here. Um, they didn't pass an offering plate or an offering box. Instead, they had many collection boxes in a row. And at the top of each box was like a funnel-shaped bowl. And it poured down inside of the box. And when people would give, uh, they would drop their coins into that trumpet-shaped uh, horn which was made out of a goat's horn, and the coins would all clatter as they made their way down inside the box. Like a trumpet, their, their giving was noisy. And historians tell us that as people would give, as they lined up in the temple, they would give as loudly as they possibly could. I don't know if you've been around those uh, change machines inside the grocery stores at all. Yeah, have you ever seen somebody dumping a bunch of quarters and change uh, nickels and dimes into this machine at the grocery store? It all goes in, and at the end, they get a receipt. They take the receipt to the counter, and they give them dollar bills for their cash. Raise your hand if you've seen that. You know what I'm talking about. It's pretty noisy, isn't it? In fact, it's so noisy, I don't want to use it. It's obnoxious, and it's annoying. Um, those people that gave back then, they would take their coins, and I'm just gonna, this is a, a bag filled with coins. It's my younger, youngest daughter's bags. I don't know how she got this much, this much money <laughs> inside this bag, but people would take their, their bag and they would take their coins and as they would walk through the temple, whatever it was that they were going to give, <laughs> they would drop it down inside the bowl and it would roll around inside the funnel and it would fall into the box and the religious leaders would take note of the people that gave. As they walked through, if they were given a lot, they'd stand there and pour their money out into the, the bowl and everybody would pause, everybody would stop and everybody would look to see who was, who was giving such a large amount. The louder the noise the greater the recognition. In context, back then, giving was a look at me experience. Giving was a look at me experience. People who heard the noise would think to themselves, wow, that person must really be devoted to God because of the amount that they're giving. Look at how much they gave. God must really love them and they must really love God. All hail the wonderful giver. And then they would be patted on the back by other people and they would be recognized and they would receive an affirming nod from the Pharisees as they stood and they oversaw the collection that day. And the Pharisees would nod their head in approval and say, oh, good job, great gift. Well, maybe you grew up in churches that were a little similar. Uh, maybe if you had a special offering, maybe designated toward a building fund, maybe the church said, hey, if you want to join our $10,000 club, you can give $10,000 and you'll get your name on a plaque inside the hallway. You ever been there? 
Ever experience that? Raise your hand if you've experienced that. Raise your hand if you remember a giving campaign that promised recognition in return for a contribution. Raise your hand if it bothered you. Raise your hand if it bothered you because you didn't give anything. <laughs> so that takes us to today's passage of Scripture. Jesus and his disciples are at the temple, and Jesus is watching all these big givers giving their, big, uh, giving their large amounts of money, and he notices somebody that nobody else seems to notice. Luke chapter 21, beginning in verse 1. Jesus looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the offering box. And he saw a poor widow put in two small copper coins. And he said, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she had. Repeat that after me. All she had. All she had to live on. So while all these wealthy people were lugging their coins in and clattering them into the trumpet to declare their pious devotion and love for God, this widow woman was standing in the line and quietly drops in two small coins without being noticed. She went on her way. There was no recognition from other people, no pat on the back. She dropped her coins in and she left. Now we can all learn something from this woman Generosity desires confidentiality, not credit. Generosity desires confidentiality, not credit. See, if you and I are to be truly generous, then we should not want recognition for what we contribute or what we give to other people. If you are kind and you are compassionate and you give to somebody in need, if you're truly generous, you don't want the world to know about it. We don't toot our own horn. We don't give seeking credit. Now, Christmas is right around the corner. And I love one of the things that our life groups do. Typically, our life groups will figure out somebody that they can help out uh, during the Christmas season and they raise money and they provide toys or they provide funds. I want to encourage you, keep it as confidential as possible and watch what the Lord does. Yeah, let your life group know as you're collecting those funds, but keep it confidential. Don't boast about it and watch and see what God will do with your generosity. Uh, now, I've, I've wrestled with whether or not I should mention this, but I figured I would fall on the side of grace, and I ask you to show me some grace if I overstep. There's a, there's a family that is living in our community. Uh, there's two children. The father is a quadriplegic, and they're raising their grandchildren because their, uh, their daughter has just made a lot of poor decisions. If you want to help bless this family in the community, mom's a hard worker. She's doing all that she can. If you want to help bless uh, th this family this, this Christmas season, I, I want you to encourage you, drop by the church office and we will make sure that every, every way that you want to bless them is taken care of. But we're not gonna put your name in lights. I won't mention you on social media. I won't blast a TikTok video about your generosity because like this widow woman understood, generosity desires confidentiality, not credit. So now let's talk about the amount that she gave because Jesus made a pretty, pretty interesting statement. The two coins that this woman gave were called leptin. They were the smallest monetary coins inside the Greek financial system. By today's standard of money, the coins back then were worth about 75 cents each. So she gave about, by today's standards, $1.50. 
that was all that she had in her possession, and she gave it all away. Everything that she had to live on, she gave it away. Everything she had to buy food with, every penny that she had, Jesus said she gave it away. She didn't give 10% of it. She didn't give seven cents of it, seven and a half cents of it, or a dollar and a half or whatever, 15 cents of it. She gave 100% of what she had away. And it's interesting that Jesus didn't try to stop her. This woman was in poverty. This woman was a widow. This woman had no support at home, yet she's giving it all away. He didn't reach into the offering box and say to her, look, your money's no good here. You go and be blessed. Go get something to eat. In fact, let me bless this dollar fifty dollars, whatever. Well, I keep forgetting what, what it was. You, I'm going to bless this 75 cents of coins, dollar, dollar fifty worth of coins, and I'm going to turn it into $100. He didn't do that. Even though it was far less monetarily speaking than what anybody else gave, Jesus said she gave more. And that's because God measures generosity by the leftovers. God measures generosity by the leftovers. Now, we often think that it's people with a lot of wealth that are the generous givers. If one's wealthy, if somebody has a lot of money, they can be generous. But if somebody is poor, they can't be generous. In the context of this scripture, the wealthy people were giving loudly, but then they went home to their homes they went home to their stock pantries. They went home to their servants. They went home to their families. They went home to their large bank accounts. But this woman, Jesus said, had nothing left after she gave. See, that kind of moves the goalpost when we think about generosity. You know, oftentimes as followers of Jesus, we think 10%. If I'm giving 10%, I'm generous. If I'm tithing, then I'm generous. See, I, I, I tithe, we give. I strive to leave generous tips when I'm out. I, I try to help people. But I always have money left over after the weekend worship service. And if I hit the lottery, I wouldn't give it all to the church. I would hold back some of it, and I wouldn't pretend that I gave it all to the church either. I also don't play the lottery, so the chances of me winning the lottery are, are pretty minimal. And I'm not suggesting that you empty out your checkings and your savings account uh, with a desire to be generous. I do think the example of this woman and what Jesus said gives us a different understanding on what generosity truly is. See, this woman gave even though it hurt her to give. She blessed others even though it wasn't a blessing for herself. She literally needed to buy food because she was in poverty and this was all she had. If there was anybody that ever understood that walked the planet who knew about generosity, it was Jesus. If you're a follower of Jesus, you know that Jesus couldn't have given any more for you and I. Jesus gave up his life for you and for me. He didn't sacrifice just a little bit. He didn't die 10% on the cross. He sacrificed it all. When Jesus was suffering on the cross, when he was tortured to death, he gave up everything. Jesus came into this world 2,000 years ago to demonstrate that there was a creator God who loved us, who has not forgotten about us. And Jesus showed God's love and his generosity by healing the sick, by curing the blind, by giving... Uh, 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 by, by allowing the deaf's hearing to be restored. 
He cured the diseased and he cured the crippled. He poured out his life in generosity. Jesus didn't have to serve like he served, but he poured it all out. And just when his followers thought that Jesus couldn't possibly do any more, Jesus emptied out his life through his death. He gave everything and he died to pay the price for your sins and for my sins. And even in his death, Jesus gave away or gave us his righteousness. Even in his death, he was thinking about you and I 2,000 years later, and he was imparting to us his perfection so that you and I, if we're committed followers of Jesus, if we've committed our life to him, if we've surrendered our life to him, you and I can stand in front of God when we die, perfected. God will look at it, look at us as though we had never sinned because we have received Jesus' righteousness, his perfection. Now, if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, but you want to surrender your life to Christ, our prayer team will be here at the close of the last song. They would love to encourage you to surrender your life to Jesus. All you've got to do is walk forward and say, hey, I'm ready to become a follower of Christ. But if you are already a follower of Jesus, do you see by the widow's example and Jesus' own example how Jesus really raises the bar on what we consider to be generous? See, this woman's example forces me to ask myself the question, by God's standard, am I generous? By God's standard, am I really generous or am I just getting by? Would you like a verse that's gonna step on your toes and make you mad at me for a little bit? Just say yes, because I'm gonna give it to you. 1 John 3, 17, John wrote, if someone has enough money to live well, and sees a brother or sister in need, but shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? See, giving demonstrates that as followers of Jesus, we have God's love living inside of us. We have God's love for all of mankind within us. And when we're giving, when we're generous, when we show compassion to others, we're demonstrating that we are filled with God's love. And we can't meet all the needs of every person everywhere, but I think we would all agree that as followers of Christ, uh, Christ we can do something. We can help somebody. And I find it challenging that the widow was in need when she gave. The widow was in poverty when she gave. And Jesus said that as poor as she was, she gave everything to live on voluntarily. There was nobody twisting her arm to make sure that she gave. Why did she give? Why didn't Jesus stop her? Can I tell you that it's not in the text, but this is what I'm convinced of. Because Jesus pointed to the woman as an example of generosity, that widow woman wanted to give. She was filled with God's love and she wanted to give. It was, it was within her. If Jesus had tried to stop her from giving, he wouldn't have been able to stop her. She'd have shoved Jesus out of the way to get to the collection box. Jesus didn't try to stop her because this woman was compelled and motivated by love. 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says, you must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure for God loves a person who gives cheerfully. Can I tell you that I believe this woman was almost skipping through that line. 
She wasn't walking through the line with a grim face. Uh, she might have been starving, but she didn't show it. She wasn't acting like she didn't want to give, like sometimes we do, right? She wasn't like, how much do I have to write this check out for? She wasn't grimacing. This woman, because Jesus pointed her out as an example of generosity, this woman was giving with great joy. Jesus couldn't have stopped that. This widow woman would have knocked him down and would have put it in there and she would have skipped away. She wanted to give. She didn't feel guilty. She didn't feel pressure. And that's what genuine generosity does. Genuine generosity wants to give. Genuine generosity is filled with God's love. I imagine that she had a smile on her face and joy in her heart. That's why Jesus noticed her. The rest of the people that were given, they weren't pointed out. The rest of the people that gave large amounts of money weren't pointed out by Jesus. But the woman who gave almost nothing gave more than all the people had given that day. Because while they gave out of their abundance, she gave out of her need. That's what genuine generosity looks like. So that's why it makes me ask myself the question, well, I left a good tip, but guess what? I got money at, you know, I got money in the bank account. I'm okay. It raises the bar on what is truly generous. So even when we think we're being generous, we're not yet being generous to that point. Is giving good? Yes. Is generosity good? Yes. Is it good that we have something to, you know, a shelter to go back home to? Yes. God's provided for us. But if we ever get in the zone where we pat ourselves on the back and say we're giving enough, this woman's example suggests otherwise. And what Jesus indicated about her suggests otherwise. So I want to encourage you. I want you to know that as you give, nobody wants you to give under pressure, not even God. So if you struggle with that in your heart, just say, God, help me to be a cheerful giver. Help me to want to give. Help me to desire to give. And I think that as God increases your desire to give, as God increases the joy in your heart to give, you are going to experience so much blessing from God that he's, you're going to experience his presence, you're going to experience his nearness, and he's going to just show up in your life in an amazing way. This widow woman understood that God takes our it's not that much and turns it into something incredible. And it shouldn't surprise us because that is what our redeeming God does. He takes our brokenness, he takes our emptiness, he takes our sorrow and he turns it into something beautiful. He redeems our sinful nature and he transforms us into the people of God that he's created us to be. So look to the woman, this widow woman, as an example of the kind of generosity that Jesus commended. And ask God to help you become like that widow woman who was willing to give everything. If the need ever arises, be willing to give all. Let's pray together. Father, we want to say thank you for this passage of Scripture. We want to say thank you for this illustration, this widow woman. And God, thank you for what you teach us through her. And Father, we, we confess and we admit that, Lord, it's, it hurts. It, it hurts a little bit to know and to become convinced that even when we think we're being generous, we've not yet even touch the scale of generosity to the extent that this woman did. 
And, and so, Lord, help us to become more like that. Continue to provide for us, to continue to care for us. And, Father, help us to raise the bar in our own hearts on what it means to be truly generous with other people to be generous with compassion, to be generous with love, to be generous with kindness, with concern, and to even be generous in our finances. Father, we trust you with them, and we trust you with our hearts. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. And all God's people said,